Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship. It's so wonderful to have all of you here this morning and a special welcome to any guests that we may have joining us today. I'm a reminder that we have our Taking Faith Home insert as always in our bulletin. So it's a great way to provide some devotions and moments for prayer throughout your week. Um, So you're invited to take that home with you. Highlighting a few of our announcements, Um, next Sunday, Amber Kalina is going to join us in worship, and she will be providing our sermon for the day. And we're also going to be taking a free will offering to support her seminary studies. So Amber is about to start her second year at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. So it's a a four-year degree to become a pastor in the ELCA, and she'll be starting her second year of studies. And we've committed to supporting her with both prayer and also a financial gift. So starting next Sunday, um, we'll take a free will offering. You're invited to put it either in the offering plate or stop by the office. Um, And there's more details about how you can support Amber in your bulletin. Next Monday, we have our block party, so you all are invited um, to that. It'll be a great chance for food, fun, and fellowship. And we're also looking for a few more people to help out with working at that. So you can sign up online or talk to me about how you can get plugged in. Um, Sunday school is going to kick off on September 9th. Um, We are looking for a few more Sunday school teachers. And if you think, I don't even have kids, and I actually have great grandkids and not even grandkids, we want you. You would be great. Um, We're looking for team teachers, so you'd be committing to only two or three Sundays throughout the fall. So if that's something that you would be interested in, you can talk to myself or to Laura Flatow, who is our education chair. And then finally, just want to highlight that Justice Journeys is going to have their silent auction the end of September. Um, So they're looking for items for donations. So you can read more details about that in the bulletin. Now let's take a moment to center our hearts and minds on God through our worship this morning. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Amen. Trust in God's promise of forgiveness. Let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. Amen. Will you rise as you are able as we sing together?
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For peace in the world, for the wellness of the church. You. Will you join me in prayer? Ever loving God, your Son gives himself as living bread for the life of the world. Fill us with such a knowledge of his presence that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life to serve you continually through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our musical message this morning is from the Friends in Faith.
The Old Testament lesson is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. A reading from Proverbs. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls. She calls for the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. You are the simple it, to those without sense. She says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and leave, live and walk in the way of insight. The word of the Lord. The New Testament lesson is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. A reading from Ephesians. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, do not get drunk with wine, that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. You'd please stand for our gospel affirmation. Our gospel message is found in the sixth chapter of John, beginning with the 51st verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Well, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Well, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the early 1900s, the automaker Henry Ford asked an electrical genius by the name of Charlie Steinmetz to build all the generators in his factory. Well, one day all those generators quit working. And the repairmen, they couldn't find the problem for the life of them. So Ford then called Steinmetz, who, of course, came to the factory and started tinkering around with some of the equipment and working with things, and all of a sudden, in a matter of just an hour or so, flips the big old switch and all the generators take off whirring back to life. Well, later that week, Henry, Henry Ford gets a bill from Steinmetz for $10,000. And the flabbergasted, rather tight-fisted automaker couldn't believe his eyes. So he was going to inquire with Steinmetz about what on earth is this bill all about? Steinmetz replies to him, he says, you know, for tinkering with the generators, 10 bucks. 
for knowing where to tinker, 9,990. Obviously, Henry paid the bill. You know, Steinmetz had what the repairman lacked, and that was an understanding of how the machines were put together. The repairman had the knowledge. The repairman had the knowledge, but Steinmetz had that special wisdom. The repairman, they knew how to repair the generators, but only Steinmetz knew how to build them. Wisdom. It's a word we don't hear much anymore. You know, its daily use is, seems to have died with the old wise men of the native Indian culture. I know it's a word that I rarely use in my vocabulary. I mean, in our days, it's more accepting to use words kind of like smart or intelligent, but usually not wise. And that's probably because, well, we're the kind of people that like to measure stuff. We like to measure quantities and qualities. We're quick to correlate years of education and experience with being smart or having knowledge. And I guess we can do that you know, to some extent, but it just isn't possible to insert wisdom into that equation. I guess it's just, maybe it's just another one of those virtues that's been found to be difficult to deal with and therefore has kind of slowly slipped away out of our fingers. Uh, I think many of you probably remember back in 1961, President Kennedy, he made that special speech when he said, we're gonna, we're gonna put a man on the moon in this decade. I think many of you probably remember that. Well, two and a half years later, of course, he was assassinated. But what happened in 1969? Well, we sat in front of our television sets and we watched those three men and a couple of them land on the moon and walk around on the moon. It was right on television. I mean, this was knowledge that was used for the good of all mankind. It was wisdom in its finest hour. But today, well, today that same organization seems to be kind of spinning its wheels. You don't hear much from them anymore. And it's not because of a shortage of knowledge or smarts or intelligence or anything like that. They just seem to be floundering with, the, with how to use it. Medicine is another place where you'll see this often. I mean, when I was a child, and I'm sure many of you can remember 50, 60 years ago, physicians were forced to actually use the knowledge in diagnosing and treating disease, to actually use it. In fact, in order to be successful at all, they'd have to, to learn to incorporate the knowledge, what they've learned in, in class, and take that and incorporate it and develop a special intuition. You know, it's like the gut feeling that a person gets. You're presented with a problem that doesn't exactly fit everything just perfectly, but something just tells you. You know that kind of feeling? That's actually the, the same kind of medicine that goes on right now in Africa, which would make, what makes it so difficult for physicians in our country to go to Africa and, um, and um, uh, practice medicine. But here, physicians, well, they schedule a number of tests, and the instruments that perform the tests come back with all the numbers, and they put the numbers in the range, right? Whether they're high, whether they're low, whether it's right in the range, if it's normal. And then, of course, some of them will even make a suggestion of what might cause that erroneous result. Kind of like a diagnosis of sorts. So now, if someone were to ask you what wisdom meant, what it really meant, what would you say? I mean, would you refer to, to, uh, to one's accumulation of facts and experience and education, years of college? Many people, including those of us who are older, make the mistake of thinking that, that we're just wiser simply because we've been around longer. You know, we've acquired more knowledge and life experience over the years, and that part's true to an extent. But for wisdom, it's more, it takes more than that. Listen to what Webster's uh, definition is for wisdom. Webster says wisdom is 
the power of judging rightly and following the soundest course of action based on knowledge, experience, and understanding. In other words, wisdom discerns between what is right and wrong, what is evil and what is good for the well-being of man. And you know, both of our, both the Old Testament lesson today in Proverbs and our New Testament lesson in Ephesians, they tell us that wisdom should not be taken lightly because our use of our wisdom is going to affect our lives and our relationship with God. But even though wisdom may have slipped out of our daily vocabulary, it's not completely gone. I mean, maybe it's more about how we use or trust our wisdom that's become difficult. For example, we understand that human actions can have a significant impact on the environment. But we also know that when God said that we should fill the earth and subdue it, that it wasn't just an open license to completely wipe out the diversity of God's creation. We get all that. But we don't always practice it. I mean, wisdom doesn't always prevail, right? And even today, we still don't act all that wisely when it comes to the environment. But also another thing, and many of you will, will recall this, we've also come to realize that it only takes one person's knowledge used for evil means to wipe out the financial dreams of thousands of people as if it's a type of wisdom that's gone wrong. And I'm sure you recognize Bernie Madoff or the Enron Corporation. That's just a couple examples. There's many. We're a culture that has really come to, to struggle with what it means to have wisdom and to be skeptical when we're confronted with it because it has caused damage. But Paul tells us, Apostle Paul, he says, if you live wisely and you make the most of your time, recognize the evil that's present in each day and then keep from getting drunk on the meaningless stuff in life and refrain from being foolish. Well, that's when you're going to come to better understand the Lord's will for us. And the Lord desires us to be wise. But we're not alone. Of course, in so much of what we think and so much of what happens to us, we're just not alone in trying to understand and accept Paul's instruction about wisdom because wisdom has been, it's been viewed as a foundational virtue in, in many cultures throughout time, not just ours. It's also been recognized as a problem in living successfully in these cultures. So, this was actually examined. Harvard, some researchers at Harvard, they got together and they sought to construct a list of personal strengths that were common across many different cultures over history. Okay? So these researchers looked at a number of different cultures over history, and they looked at all the virtues that made people healthy and productive in those cultures. Then they compared the list. And the six main strengths that came out of, the, of, of those, all those lists, one thing for sure that they had in common was wisdom. That is how to use one's knowledge for good. It is important in every single culture. From the beginning of time, God made us a knowledgeable people perfectly capable of acting wisely, but we just struggle. Acting with wisdom is a struggle. It's hard. Yet even when we have disagreements, and we do all the time, we stall out when we try to solve problems, um, even trying to work through problems the right way, God still expects our wisdom to promote what is good in that situation. In other words, it's still up to you and I. 
So the gift of wisdom that's given to each of us is nothing that's out of reach because living in wisdom is living toward what is good and right and true for ourselves and for each other using the knowledge that each of us already has. And that's something we can do because in living as a wise people, we're simply living, we're living as people who can better understand God's desire for us. And that is to live in harmony, to live in the light of Christ, and to do this each and every day for the good of all. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, in our efforts to become a knowledgeable people, help us to just not fall short of what you desire, which is to use our knowledge and our experience for the good of all creation. In other words, to act wisely. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. We'll continue with our hymn of the day. rise as you are able as we confess our faith together. 
that the whole church let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in our loving and almighty God, who abundantly provides the bread of life to all who hunger, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. O Lord, you build your church, the body of Christ, and sustain it with living bread. Let wisdom guide your church and teach all its members the way of righteousness. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, bless the work of musicians, composers, writers, and all artists. Move us to even greater praise through their gifts of creativity. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our complex and wonderful wor world is a sure sign of your abundance and care. Provide for every creature. Be with those who are fighting wildfires, those who are displaced, and those who are suffering health problems because of the smoke. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, we thank you for the diversity of the nations. Shower your wisdom and mercy upon all leaders and citizens. Give us all courage to seek peace and pursue it. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, send calm and perseverance to those who are in trouble or those who live daily with great stress. Fill them with your spirit and satisfy them with your presence. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty and loving God, we look to you in hope and trust, knowing that you will do far more than we can ask or imagine. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As members of God's household, I pray the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another. As you are ready, I invite you to be seated and we will continue with the offering.
you please stand if you're able. Let's pray together our offertory prayer. Gracious God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Signs of your gracious God, receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life and so with all the choirs of angels with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn he was betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread blessed it broke it and gave it for all to eat saying this bread is a new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin and again after supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying this cup is a new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin do this for the remembrance of me Heavenly Father remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So taste and see that the Lord is good. Our Lord's table has been prepared, and all are welcome. Please be seated.
you would please stand if you're able. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace. For you are Lord forevermore. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor, give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.